Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ash Carter, professor here at the Kennedy School, and on behalf of myself and uh, Dean Joe Nye and uh, Dan Glickman of the Institute of Politics, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the first forum held in the newly rededicated forum, dedicated this past Friday to John F. Kennedy uh, Jr. And welcome also to, and I'm going to consult my satellite navigation receiver here to, um, let's say here, 42 degrees, 22.22 north latitude and 71 degrees, 07.35 west longitude. You'll see why I brought my GPS receiver uh, along in just a few uh, minutes. This is, uh, to me at least, a um, confusing and really confused time in American national security policy making and we are very privileged tonight to have one of the great thinkers and leaders of American defense in his generation, Bill Perry, to give us a current assessment of U.S. Uh, security. Bill Perry served twice at senior levels in the Pentagon. First time was during the Cold War. And uh, the threat, as perceived by the United States, was obvious. And Bill Perry devised something he called the offset strategy, under which, he said, the United States should offset all those Warsaw Pact tanks and soldiers, not with comparable mass, but with American ingenuity. And it was Bill, with, uh, with which he was very familiar as a Silicon Valley technologist, and so it was Bill Perry who founded and established the stealth program, the F-117 fighter, the B-2 bomber. Uh, it was Bill Perry who introduced the uh, uh, first chip-based precision weapons. It was Bill Perry who introduced uh, airborne satellite reconnaissance uh, techniques. And it was the reason I brought this along. It was Bill Perry who persuaded the Air Force to build the Global Positioning Satellite System, uh, which allows me, with a little handheld satellite receiver uh, like this, with the chips from Silicon Valley within it, Silicon Valley in the old days at least, uh, to uh, uh, determine exactly where I am. Uh, that was, those were the innovations that a decade later, after the Cold War, after Bill had left the Pentagon, after the Cold War ended, ended up not with defeating the Warsaw Pact, but defeating Saddam Hussein in the first Gulf War. That was the legacy of Bill Perry's first tour in the Pentagon. His second tour, of course, was as Secretary of Defense. Cold War was over then, and he realized that the job, his job in that era was fundamentally different. Uh, this was an era without uh, imminent military threat as traditionally uh, defined certainly with no peer competitor of the United States in military uh, uh, terms. And Bill recognized that the job of, B of Secretary of Defense was as much uh, a, uh, uh, concerned with preventing threats from emerging as it was countering threats that were here. And he was, I would say, our first and best statesman Secretary of Defense. Uh, I won't even begin to describe everything he did in this tour in the, in the Pentagon, only to say that when he left, he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom and the comparable medal from just about every country I can think of with which he dealt as Secretary of Defense. Um, today, when he's not getting an award, uh, which isn't all the time, uh, he is the direct, uh, professor at Stanford, uh, the co-director of the Stanford-Harvard Preventive Defense Project, of which I'm the other co-director, uh, so we are now academic collaborators. And in our research of late, we have been trying to define the wider policy towards weapons of mass destruction, proliferation and terrorism that the world needs beyond Iraq, beyond preemption, including the possibility that it's in the nature of weapons of mass destruction that the intelligence that we have upon which to base weapons of mass destruction policies uh, is inherently flawed, likely to not be there uh, in the 
with the certainty that we would wish. And my guess is Bill will touch upon this uh, among other current challenges for American security policy. Let me close by saying, for, especially to my students, no introduction of Bill Perry would be complete uh, without a word about the way he conducted himself uh, in the Pentagon. Those of us who served under him, uh, there are others here in the, in the audience. You know, George Shultz is famous for the statement, if you, if, uh, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. <laughs> and I always say in the ear of Bill Perry, there was at least one alternative to a dog in Washington. The way in which he conducted himself with decency and civility towards everyone he met uh, and especially those who worked with him was much appreciated and something I hope our students will remember. So let me introduce my admired friend and uh, our speaker tonight, Bill Perry. Thank you, Ash, for that warm and generous introduction. Just a comment about the technology development in my first stint in the Pentagon. There were, of course, a few other people involved in those developments, too. Also, that while I'm proud of my role in that, I'm also mindful of some of the unintended and even negative consequences of the military superiority that resulted from that. As terrible as the 9-11 tragedy was, it could be only the precursor of a far greater tragedy, terrorists detonating a nuclear bomb in an American city. No one, no one should doubt that Al-Qaeda would execute this nightmare scenario if only they could get their hands on the nuclear weapon. President Bush recognized that danger when he stated that keeping the worst weapons out of the hands of the worst people was his highest priority. But the national security programs that have been put in place since 9-11 do not reflect that priority. The Defense Department, for example, has more than doubled the funding allocated to national ballistic missile defense and authorized the deployment of an interim system. But even if this system were to meet its stated objectives, which is by no means certain, it offers no defense at all against a nuclear bomb set off by a terrorist who delivered their bomb in a truck or a freighter instead of a missile. The Department of Energy is proposing to renew the development of nuclear bombs with emphasis on bunker busters and low yield tactical bombs. It is thought that these weapons would be more credible as threats than high yield strategic bombs and therefore be more likely to deter rogue <coughs> nations. It is not clear that these new weapons would actually increase the deterrence to rogue nations. What is clear is that such weapons could increase the incentive for these nations to build nuclear weapons themselves as a deterrent to us. And it is equally clear that nuclear weapons in the hands of rogues increase the likelihood of a terror group getting one. Thus, the proposed new American nuclear programs may actually be counterproductive to the goal of keeping nuclear weapons out of the hands of terrorists. But perhaps the most dramatic change made by the administration since 9-11 has been their new emphasis on preemption. The national security strategy issued after 9-11 called for the use of military preemption as a means of stopping rogue nations from developing nuclear weapons. And the preemptive attack on Iraq is seen by many, both in and out of the United States, as only the first application of this strategy. Military preemption is and must be one option open to the United States. And because of the dominant power of our military, it is generally a feasible option. But we should exercise this option only when the danger is grave and only when the danger is imminent. Military operations involve casualties, political costs, and unintended consequences, as we are seeing today in Iraq. And more than any other decision our government makes, the decision to initiate preemption must be based on solid intelligence. There has been much discussion 
lamenting the inadequacy of our intelligence about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. But in fact, the problem of assessing biological weapon programs and enriched uranium nuclear programs is inherently difficult. Not only did we have problems making confident assessments in Iraq, we were having similar problems in Iran and North Korea. In all three countries, we have only fragmentary and inconclusive evidence <coughs> as to the state of the biological weapon program or the state of their enriched uranium <coughs> nuclear program. That is not because our intelligence agencies are derelict, but because the facilities involved in such programs can be small, decentralized, and without a distinctive physical signature. This is in sharp contrast to the facilities needed for long-range ballistic missiles or plutonium-based nuclear weapons, which make those programs highly visible to our satellite reconnaissance systems. The intelligence gap that we are facing today is in some ways similar to the intelligence gap we faced in the 1950s, trying to assess the missile and nuclear programs <coughs> then underway in the Soviet Union. In the absence of solid intelligence, our national intelligence estimates were based on worst case estimates. And the Department of Defense based its strategic weapons program on those estimates. As a result, Exaggerated threat estimates became the principal drivers in the arms race that spiraled out of control in the 50s and the 60s. Audacious new satellite reconnaissance programs initiated by President Eisenhower and sustained by President Kennedy closed that gap. Incidentally, that story is told brilliantly by Philip Taubman in a recent book called Secret Empire, which I highly recommend to all of you. These new satellite reconnaissance systems allowed our analysts to make accurate assessments of the Soviet missile and nuclear capability, thereby facilitating rational planning of our national security programs. Today, we are faced with a different kind of intelligence gap. Our satellites continue to give us good estimates of long-range missile programs and plutonium-based nuclear weapons programs but they are inadequate to detect and identify the small dispersed facilities typical of uranium enrichment programs and biological weapons. This is especially true if the proliferators make a serious attempt to keep their programs covert. Thus, we may expect continuing difficulty in making confident assessments of nuclear or biological programs in nations that have an uh, have some reason to try to keep their programs covert. As a consequence, when confronted with what we believe to be a covert nuclear program, we will generally not be able to execute a policy of preemption. Having the policy is one thing, being able to execute is another thing, since solid intelligence defining the threat is really required and will be rightly demanded by the American public. Indeed, in the wake of the failure to detect weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, the public is likely to be skeptical of any declaration of weapons of mass destruction threat, even when justified. Therefore, as a matter of policy, preemption should be considered only for those cases where proliferation is imminent and only after the failure of serious efforts to curb the proliferation through coercive diplomacy. And as a matter of practice, preemption should be exercised only when intelligence is compelling that the threat really exists. Based on the ease which some nuclear and biological weapon programs can be concealed, it is doubtful that we can count on having such intelligence. All of the policies and programs that I've mentioned, which are now being pursued at the highest priority by our government, in fact, have dubious relevance to keeping nuclear weapons out of the hands of terrorists. So where should we be placing our emphasis? Our top national security priority, our first line of defense against catastrophic terrorism, must be preventing the spread of nuclear weapons. During the Cold War, our success in preventing proliferation was beyond anyone's expectation, but today, this whole program could be unraveling. 
India and Pakistan have gone nuclear. North Korea is about to start serial production of nuclear weapons, and Iran is only a few years behind. Unless this tide can be stemmed, it is likely that before this decade is over, nuclear bombs will be used in regional wars and in terror attacks on American cities. Let me repeat that. Unless we can stem this tide, it is likely that before this decade is over, nuclear bombs will be used in regional wars and in terror attacks on American cities. The acid test of America's security programs is do they make that catastrophic outcome less likely? Our current programs, in my judgment, do not pass that acid test. So how can we get the world back on the non-proliferation track? The beginning of wisdom is to recognize that underlying incentives to proliferate are really different and in some ways stronger than during the Cold War. The unmatched power of America's military, this is the unintended consequence I was talking about, the unmatched power of America's military has led some potential opponents to believe that nuclear weapons represent their only hope of deterring the United States from defending its interests, as for example, on the Korean Peninsula. In particular, some nations apparently believe that their possession of nuclear weapons may be needed to head off a preemptive attack from the United States. Indeed, North Korean officials have made just such statements. Besides state proliferators, non-state actors like Al-Qaeda are actively pursuing nuclear weapon programs and other weapons of mass destruction. If they get them, they will use them. Deterrence does not work against extremists who are willing, even eager, to die for their cause. The small bit of good news here is that a terror group is not likely to be able to build a nuclear bomb from scratch because of the complexity in producing the appropriate fissile material. The bad news is that they might be able to obtain the bomb or perhaps the fissile material from a nuclear power. Thus, the danger of a terror group getting a nuclear bomb is linked to the danger of a rogue nation going nuclear. During the Cold War, we worried about the use of nuclear weapons by the governments that made them. Today, we must also deal with a very different threat, a threat that some of the nuclear weapons owned by a rogue nation might be sold or otherwise fall into the hands of a terrorist. It should not be surprising that the tools developed during the Cold War to prevent proliferation are not adequate to deal with these new threats. We need new tools to deal with these new times. The most important new tool is the Nun Lugar program, which was initiated a decade ago to deal specifically with the problem of nuclear weapons falling into the hands of terrorists, criminals, or warlords. It has been remarkably successful in serving that goal, bringing about the dismantlement of thousands, literally thousands, of nuclear weapons, the destruction of about a thousand launchers, and the total removal of nuclear weapons from three nations, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Belarus. And it has secured hundreds of nuclear facilities in Russia, which otherwise might be vulnerable to the theft of weapons or fissile material. But much, much more remains to be done. Nanlugar needs to be accelerated. Many thousands of nuclear weapons remain, and many hundreds of facilities still do not have adequate safeguards. And Nanlugar needs to be expanded. Not covered by the Nanlugar program are many tons of fissile material in commercial nuclear programs around the world, as well as the biological weapons program in Russia. These needs have been recognized by Senator Dick Lugar, who has proposed such an accelerated and expanded program. This proposal deserves our full support, particularly since it faces an uphill battle. Disappointingly, Russia is not yet fully supporting the application of Nanlugar to their military bio biological weapons programs. And inexplicably, Senator Lugar's proposal is having tough sledding in the Congress. So if you can help 
please do so. Besides <coughs> safeguarding existing weapons and fissile material, we need to strengthen our efforts to prevent other nations from becoming nuclear powers. Historically, the most important tool for that purpose has been the Non-Proliferation Treaty, with the all-important inspection and verification carried out by the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency. The Non-Proliferation Treaty, or the NPT, allows nations to have a commercial nuclear power program if, if they agree not to make nuclear weapons and accept verification of that agreement by the IAEA. But the provisions of the NPT and its concomitant inspection have proven to be inadequate to proliferation pressures in this era. North Korea and Iran, for example, appear to be taking advantage of a loophole where they use their allowed commercial facilities to produce weapon-grade uranium or plutonium and then have the option of withdrawing from the NPT to make weapons with that fissile material. <coughs> Diplomatic efforts are underway to dissuade these nations from proceeding on that path. But if the diplomatic efforts fail, the world will be faced with two more nuclear powers, indeed two very dangerous nuclear powers. Such a development would be regarded by the United States as so dangerous that it could lead to military action by the United States or a coalition led by the United States. But such military action is, of course, dangerous in and of itself. A far better way of dealing with proliferation is to craft a more effective tool to prevent nuclear wannabes from achieving that goal. And it is clear that this tool needs to be international in scope, involving as a minimum all of the other nuclear powers. Rather than write off the NPT and the IAEA, we should seek to get an interpretation that can close the loophole now being exploited. <laughs> the provisions of the NPT should be interpreted to allow nuclear powers to control the entire fuel cycle so that non-nuclear powers would not have the option of making weapons-grade fuel and then withdrawing from the NPT. And the IAEA should have broadened inspection rights to verify compliance with this new restriction, including the right of challenge inspections. This latter is necessary to deal, for example, with the danger of an undeclared program in uranium enrichment and the great difficulty of discovering such a program by national technical means. Finally, we should recognize that in spite of the international agreements and norms, some rogues are determined to proliferate and are prepared to ignore the international community to achieve that goal. While few in numbers, the determined proliferators are the most difficult cases since the tools developed for other nations do not work with them. A stronger approach is needed to deal with the determined proliferators who cannot be reached by diplomacy, denial of technology, or threat of isolation, as the cases of North Korea and Iran seem to indicate. The tools of coercion depend on an effective counterproliferation program must therefore include a credible threat of military force. Coercion depends on there being a credible threat of military force. The key to the credibility of this threat lies with the United States military force. But the key to the legitimacy, the legitimacy of this threat, lies with the participation of the international community. Rogue proliferators endanger many nations, and the international community must stand together in dealing with this danger. But if we are to achieve this needed solidarity, we must work constructively with the international community, especially with the other nuclear powers, to achieve a consensus on the danger of proliferation and an agreement on how we must work together to prevent it. We can, in fact, win military victories unilaterally, but we cannot, we absolutely cannot prevent proliferation unilaterally. The success in preventing proliferation during the Cold War was not happenstance. It required a modicum of American restraint on its own nuclear program. It required an enormous investment of political capital on the part of successive American administrations. 
it required skillful and determined diplomacy to create the necessary international cooperation. The same restraint, the same investment of political capital, and the same determined diplomacy are required today, but have not been forthcoming. Early in my career, I was on a small team that worked around the clock to analyze Soviet missile deployments during the 13 days of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Each day, each day I believed that that crisis was about to explode into a nuclear war. Later in my career, when I was the Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, I received a telephone call at 3 o'clock in the morning from a general at the North American Air Defense Command telling me that his computers were indicating that an attack by 200 Soviet ICBMs was on the way. It was, of course, true that this was a false alarm. But it is also true that we had only a few minutes to determine that fact. So to me, the dangers of the Cold War were never academic. Those experiences seared indelibly in my consciousness that the Cold War could have at any time erupted into a nuclear holocaust. But in spite of the incredible dangers we faced, we survived the Cold War without the destruction of American and Russian cities by nuclear bombs. But that was only because President Truman had articulated a clear security strategy focused on that objective, and because successive administrations aggressively pursued national security programs designed to implement that strategy as their first priority. And that was because we were successful in convincing the free world of the danger and leading them in a united stand against that danger. We should do no less today as we are faced with the threat of nuclear bombs being detonated in American cities by terrorists. In defending the nation against this deadly threat, we must affirm that a terror group setting off a nuclear bomb in our cities is our gravest threat. We must set as our highest priority the programs and policies that have the best prospect of averting this catastrophe, even at the expense of other national security programs. And we must provide the leadership that convinces the international community to join us in executing this strategy. None of this will be easy, just as it was not easy during the Cold War to formulate the strategy and provide the leadership that avoided a nuclear holocaust. But if we fail, if terror groups are able to detonate nuclear bombs in our cities, we will forever after be asking ourselves why we did not take the timely action to avert the catastrophe. And if we succeed, our children and our grandchildren will thank us. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Perry is available for the next little while to answer questions. Let me just ask you to, uh, there are four microphones, uh, two here, two up there. Uh, let me ask questioners to come to the microphones. I'll rotate through the microphones. Just a couple of requests, please. Identify yourself, number one. Uh, number two, keep it short. And number three, remember that it's a question, which implies <laughs> It's not your view, but it implies that you want Secretary Perry's view. It ends with a, a slight inflection of the voice, uh -huh. <coughs> which indicates an inquiring spirit. And uh, 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 please adhere to that as well. Let me begin with this gentleman hey, here, sir. Uh, Dr. Perry, oh, I'm Martin Greenfield. I'm a retired engineer from down the river at MIT. Um, it would seem that the very loosely monitored control of the huge amount of containerized freight coming into this country makes that almost the obvious delivery vehicle for any weapon of mass destruction. Is there any possible answer to that? First of all, I agree with your premise. I think that probably would be my number one concern about how a terror group would deliver 
a nuclear bomb to an American city. It is all too easy to do. Is there an answer to it? That's, that's the tough question. There are things we could do to make it more difficult. We could things, things we could do to re increase our probability of stopping that from happening. Uh, they're expensive and we're not doing them. Uh, my own judgment is that is a failure of the planning in our Homeland Security Department. That should be a high priority on their list. Uh, even if it were, I would, I'd have to say it would not be a, a, an airtight system by any means. Sure. Uh, my name is Orjit Sengupta. I'm at the business school here. Uh, you mentioned things like North Korea and Iran, uh, but in the last few uh, months there have been a report about uh, nukes versus missiles trade between Pakistan and North Korea, and between uh, there's a report that Iran got its uh, nuclear technology from Pakistan as well, which happens to be one of the greatest allies of the U.S. Now, can we really focus in on the so-called rogue states or the axis of evil without looking at um, who are assisting them, who might be some of the greatest allies of the U.S.? Without confirming all of your hypothesis, let me simply say that the answer to your question, though, I think is yes. In order to deal with this problem, we have to deal with the people supplying the, te uh, the technology. Uh, I would not rule out the possibility that a nation like North Korea can do this all by themselves. But in fact, our best intelligence is they have had some support, indeed, from Pakistan. So we have to, first of all, get the nuclear powers to agree this is serious and to, and to stop playing those kind of games. Because it can, it can adversely affect them as well as us. Uh, nearly every major nuclear power, after it be, became a nuclear power, has made the mistake of sharing the technology with at least one other country. And that's why we have so many today. Uh, United States with Britain and France. Russia with China, China with Pakistan, Pakistan with North Korea, and so it goes. Uh, it's not that uh, these countries might not have achieved it on their own, but to certainly facilitate their getting it. So yes, I think it's very important that the nuclear powers stop playing those kind of games. My name is Josh Good. I have a human nature question about uh, Dr. Strangelove and the Judeo-Christian scriptural tradition. Um, it seemed like you said that the beginning of wisdom was something about uh, not overestimating the potential of military capability. What, what if any, are the implications um, of bin Laden's statement about the United States being a weak horse on that front from 98? I don't understand the question. Uh, so, so I'm just asking um, if, if the whole world isn't necessarily like Brattle Street, and if human nature isn't always able to be rationally convinced, the free world, are there any implications of bin Laden saying that the United States was a weak horse uh, during that part of Clinton's tenure? you should pick the strong horse, the idea being that if we showed weakness, I think this is the premise of the question, that that emboldens those like bin Laden who would attack us, what to do about that mindset. Is that the question? That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think we have to encourage bin Laden, nor do I think we know how to discourage him. He has his own agenda. He's proceeding on his own path, and his path includes doing great damage to America and to Americans. <clears throat> what we have to do is find a way of defending ourselves against him. But I do not know. Of I think there are many, many reasons for wanting to improve things we do in the world to decrease the breeding ground for terrorists. But I do not think that American policies are what either lead to bin Laden's or are, have any effective way of dis discouraging them. Dr. Perry, my name is Lala Kadir on MPP2. Uh, in 1961, President Eisenhower in his farewell address to the nation, warned against an emerging military-industrial complex. Today, nearly 40 years, over 40 years later, uh, the media and members of the academic community have consistently alluded to a volatile marriage between the defense industry, energy firms, and our civilian leadership, particularly with respect to post-war reconstruction bids in Iraq and Afghanistan. Do you believe these assertions are grounded? And if so, could you expound upon that? And if not, do you share President Eisenhower's concern? President Eisenhower, I think, was reacting 
uh, rightly reacting, I think, to the great pressure that had been brought indeed by many people in the defense industry <clears throat> that are accusing him of allowing the missile gap to have developed. That led uh, to a very bitter campaign, presidential campaign, not against him, but against his Vice President Nixon, and eventually led to President Kennedy's victory in that. President Kennedy, one of his campaign positions was that there was missile gap, which President Eisenhower had allowed to happen. This was, in my judgment, a bum rap. And I do believe that, some asked, that it was fueled by people in the defense industry who were uh, wanting to have a larger defense budget and more programs. Uh, my own judgment is that the defense industries have far less influence today by perhaps an order of magnitude than they had in 1961. So maybe we have been mindful of President Eisenhower's injunction. My name is Alexander Rossolimo. I'm with CSSP, a think tank. Uh, about 11 years ago, a Russian nuclear physicist from the secret city of Azamas 16, I heard from him that uh, if terrorists were to steal a Russian tactical nuclear weapon and explode it conventionally, that is with dynamite, in a major urban area, the result would be much more dangerous than its nuclear detonation. That's because the plutonium should be dispersed, it would contaminate the environment, people would invariably get cancer, and it has a half-life of 28,000 years, which means that it would live on forever. It costs hundreds of billions of dollars mm -hmm. to decontaminate New York City, for instance. So in your uh, presentation, you emphasized uh, the uh, nuclear detonation by terrorists. But how do you assess the risk of a so-called dirty bomb being detonated, not with um, mild uh, radioactive systems, but with plutonium, for instance? Mm. And what should we do about it? Uh, my concern about a dirty bomb is at least an order of magnitude, maybe two orders of magnitude less than my concern about a real bomb because of the two orders of magnitude less damage that it could do. And it's also much harder to stop it from happening. But if that question had been asked me when I was the Secretary of Defense, I would have turned to my nuclear expert and asked him, what should I say? How would you answer that? He's very good at that, always has been. I don't quite agree with the, the premise, uh, 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 that is, that uh, the uh, uh, plutonium would be widely dispersed and that it presents, as plutonium, an imminent uh, health risk to lots of people. So I would disagree with the premise of the fellow from Arzamas uh, that, you, uh, that you cited. A radiological bomb is usually, ref usually refers to something different, which is highly radioactive material, which plutonium is not highly radioactive material dispersed. That's a big problem as, as well. It makes a very ugly mess and a very fearful mess. But it's nothing like a nuclear detonation in terms of the immediacy of the death and destruction uh, that uh, occurs. So these are, this is a fearsome thing you're talking about, but it, I, I would agree with what Secretary Perry just said, which is a couple orders of magnitude less. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Krishna Guha, and I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. I just wanted to ask whether you believed that, in principle, the U.S. should be prepared to sign non-aggression pacts with nations like North Korea and Iran as part of an overall agreement to have some kind of verifiable end to their nuclear programs. <clears throat> Let me rephrase the question a little bit. It's a good, very good question. Uh, too narrow, though, by saying they're signing a non-aggression pact. Uh, I believe, and I have so recommended to our government, that we should be prepared <coughs> to make security assurances of some sort to North Korea if that's what it takes to get them off their nuclear weapon kick. I think it's a very good trade-off, and I think it costs us virtually nothing since we don't plan to invade North Korea. Uh, we should be quite willing to say that. The trick is finding the right way of crafting that statement so that it does not undermine our treaty commitment to South Korea to defend it in case of attack. But I think our diplomats are capable of finding the language that can do that adequately. Secretary Perry, my name is Leif Eric Easley. I'm a student at the uh, Graduate School in the Department of Government. Um, my question has to do with, um, I'd, I'd like to ask you to 
identify key factors for us which impact upon the level of cooperation in the U.S.-South Korean Security Alliance, uh, in particular in dealing with North Korea, but in, in general, issues which impact upon the level of both sides, cooperation, nationalist actions, unitary actions, whether those be status of forces agreement incidents or the level of threat perception by South Korea about the North. That's a wonderful question. I just turned down an invitation to attend a two-day conference on just that subject. The uh, South Korean has been uh, one of our most important allies for decades now. And it's coming up, that alliance, I th in my judgment, is coming apart at the seams. There are many reasons for that. One of them is simply the, I think the South Korean people are weary of having so many American soldiers there and right in their face, so to speak. If you visit Seoul, for example, you'll discover that the very choice properties are occupied by the American military yeah. right in the heart of Seoul. Uh, with that many soldiers in the country, there, there will be on occasion accidents, or a particularly tragic accident over a year ago in which uh, an American vehicle, military vehicle, ran over two Korean girls, which killed them. And of course, that caused a lot of, that stoked the fires of anti-American feeling there. Uh, I think most fundamentally, though, there, there are two, two fundamental differences between the United States and South Korea in regarding this alliance. The first is that the younger generation of South Koreans do not see a threat from North Korea. They see North Korea as a subject of a, um, a, a, a sister state in which they, they want to, they, they, they seek reunification with North Korea and are not, I think, fully aware of the, perhaps the dangers of trying to deal with North Korea in getting to that point. Uh, reunification is a wonderful goal, but that is likely to be an awkward transition in getting from where we are now to that point. So, so there is a different judgment, at least among the younger generation of South Koreans, upon the extent to which North Korea poses a threat to them. There's also a view in not just younger generations, but many South Koreans that I've talked with, that nuclear weapons in North Korea are no big deal. They say they would never, never, never use nuclear weapons against their brother Koreans. Well, that may or may not be true, but it doesn't really get South Korea off the hook because if North Korea uses the nuclear weapons against anybody, against the Japanese or the Americans, South Korea is right in the middle of a huge problem. So I think uh, generally there's this difference in view on as fundamental an issue as whether North Korea poses a threat and whether nuclear weapons in North Korea is a, is a particular threat. And with that huge difference in view on those very important <coughs> subjects, it's not hard to understand why our alliance is in very shaky conditions today. And it's only aggravated by the social issues which I mentioned. Hi, uh, my name is Stephen Dewey. I'm a student at the college. Um, you said that we're having difficulty determining when they're making um, smaller bombs or chemical weapons because of the nature of the facilities. So in, if that's the case, how do we determine when diplomacy has failed and when we need to go about military action? Um, looks like we didn't do that too well in Iraq, so how do we go about doing that in the future? That's a huge question. Uh, I think uh, the big thing we want to avoid is being faced with an either or alternative, which we are rapidly converging, approaching the, with North Korea today where we have to decide either we accept their nuclear weapon program or we go to war with them. I mean, there, always, there has to be a third choice, but to get to third choices, you have to work to develop them much earlier in the day. And the name of that is diplomacy. And we have simply not had any significant diplomatic relations with North Korea now for two and a half years. And that has been a big mistake, whether we might be able to recover from that. And in particular, the Good news on the North Korean front is that the Chinese government is now starting to be very much concerned that maybe we're not going to resolve the, the nuclear problem adequately, and they're getting in the act, too. They can be very constructive and helpful, I think, on this. So maybe between the Americans and the Chinese, we'll find a way of dealing with that problem. But fundamentally, we have to avoid letting problems drift until we're down to just those two awful choices, the art of diplomacy 
diplomatic strategy is finding the third choice, finding the third alternative. Yes, sir. My name is Daniel Baskin. I'm a private citizen. Um, you were emphasizing quite a bit about multilateral efforts versus unilateral efforts. But um, I think we know that a lot of countries in the United Nations are rather hostile to our interests, even when they pay lip service to, you know, they want to they do away with terrorism, that sort of thing. And we know, for example, about the Human Rights Commission, you know, Libya is in charge and a bunch of other star um, choice uh, players on that. It's so I'm just wondering how realistically successful multilateral action is going to be, even with the best of diplomacy, if certain people are just determined to be, to, to be hostile to our interests. Uh, if if uh, unilateral, at least the threat of unilateral action is necessary to kind of get things going a little bit. Uh, I, what is required to deal with the problems I'm talking about is a multilateral action, at least of the other nuclear powers. It doesn't require the whole United Nations to go along with it. It does require the other nuclear powers to go along. You cannot stop proliferation if one nuclear power wants to proliferate. So you have to get all of them to agree to that. And that's not easy. Uh, it's not going to be the, uh, our relations with the French today, which is one of the nuclear powers, is probably at an all-time low. Uh, we have, but looking back, to years when our relations with the Soviet Union and the relations with the People's Republic of China are certainly far worse than that. We have to understand, the nuclear powers have to understand that in spite of their disagreements and differences on many other issues, this is an issue in which you have a common interest, protecting, preventing the proliferation of nuclear weapons. So what I'm trying to describe here is not that we have to have harmony and agreement with, with all of these other countries. But we have to have an understanding among all nuclear powers that proliferation is a threat to everybody, and we have to stand together to keep that from happening. That's, 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 that's a single, narrow, but very important issue. Thanks, Dr. Carter. Uh, Dr. Perry, the United States faces a uh, significant, oh, sorry, sorry, Ash. Uh, Gotham Mukunda, uh, graduate of the college, former at the Kennedy School. Um, the United States faces a significantly greater threat from catastrophic terror than, for example, our European allies, and uniquely has the capacity to deal with that threat to at least some extent without their help and even in the face of their active opposition. A pure realist would say that their strategy in that situation is to free ride, to allow the United States to deal with the threat, or in fact oppose it and force the United States to pay higher costs from dealing with that threat and weaken the United States in the long run while doing nothing and reaping the benefits of having the threat dealt with by the hegemonic power. Do you see that dynamic coming into play? And if you do, if you see a free riding or even a parasitic dynamic happening, how should the United States act to align the interests of our allies, our, you know, our general allies, in situations like this where it seems in the short and long run they're better off acting either neutrally or hostily? Now, I guess my only answer to that question was that the problem has existed as long as I can remember. It's not unique to the present day. It's not unique to the war on terror. Uh, I can remember back in the, my first tour in the Pentag Pentagon in the 70s, we were always forever complaining that uh, Germany and France and Britain were free riding on the American military deployments in Europe and protecting against the threat from the Soviet Union. And that Japan was, while well, we were spending 6% of our uh, GN GNP on military Japan is only spending 1%, so they were free riding. Uh, the, so that has been a long history, and I don't think the history is going to go away. The, the general approach to dealing with the problem you're talking about is called leadership. You have to persuade other countries <laughs> that you have common goals and that you have their interest in mind as well as your interest in mind. You cannot get cooperation in the war of terrorism by talking about terrorism as a threat only to Americans. We sort of project the image to the world that we're the only ones that are affected by terrorism, which is not true. And that does not help in, try, in, in conveying this leadership view that we're trying to all work together to deal with a threat to all of us. Dr. Perry, my name is uh, Inder Singh. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. 
As you know, technological advancement is occurring at an ever-increasing pace, and it seems that uh, the creation of weapons of mass destruction will become easier and easier, especially for state powers that have resources to put behind such development. A, do you agree with that? Um, and then if so, what, how long can non-proliferation agreements really work? If there's some sort of cap on the time that non-proliferation agreements can work, what are the implications today for U.S. foreign policy? Should we be, you know, pursuing? Yes, I do agree with that, uh, which means that beyond that we cannot count on technology to be the only barrier to countries getting nuclear weapons. It requires more than that. For it requires creating the view in the whole world that nuclear weapons are a danger to everybody, and the proliferation of them is a danger to everybody. Uh, now. That view has held for many nations. I mean, Germany and Japan, for example, unquestionably have the resources and the technical capability to build a huge nuclear arsenal. They have chosen not to. They have elected not to. Most of the nations around the world have made that same decision, which is the right decision. So, uh, so Fundamentally, we cannot count on technology alone as a barrier. It's an impediment. It slows down other countries, but it does not stop them forever. It requires, first of all, persuading most countries of the world that, that it's in their best interest not to do it. And those few proliferators who will not accept that, then as I said in my talk, you had to be prepared to take coercive measures, starting off with sanctions. And, and, and those coercive measures, I repeat, must have behind them a credible threat of military action. My own view is that if the threat is credible and if it's made seriously and if it's made as part of an international effort, you will not have to use it. We have time for just a couple more questions, sir. Yep. Hi, Secretary Perry. My name's Hyun. I'm a first year uh, Kenyan school student. And just going back to North Korea, um, hypothetically speaking, if North Korea goes ahead and develops nuclear weapons, say, uh, by Christmas, and, uh, uh, you know, some Bush officials have said that go ahead and make your nukes, but we will do everything possible to continue from shipping that to, uh, I don't know, Yemen or sell it to some other country. Now, just acting out the scenario, what do we do when their ships fire back on our ship? Do we, do we fire back on them? And what if uh, they fire a cruise missile at us? Do we fire a cruise missile back at them? Do we, in fact, replay the Cuban Missile Crisis, and except this time, the bad guy has the nukes? And the bad guy had nukes the last time, too. <laughs> which I was very mindful of. Um, I am not, <clears throat> I'm not going to defend the administration's program of interdiction. I don't agree with it. I think it's the wrong, not for the strategic reasons, but the tactical reasons. I think it's a dumb idea. Um, my principal concern is what you want to interdict is the transfer of nuclear weapons. And the nuclear weapons are just so easy to, trans to smuggle out of the country that an interdiction program simply would not be successful. So I'm, I'm, I'm opposed to interdiction for two reasons. First of all, it won't work on the issue you really want it to work for. And secondly, it has all the downsides that you mentioned, which is provoking incidents, which can, go, which can no, be not go, go nowhere but bad. Hi, my name is Bridger McGaugh. I'm a student at the Kennedy School. And since we're in the Institute of Politics and we've talked a lot about foreign policy, I, th I thought I'd ask a question strictly about American politics. In over, just over a year, we're going to elect a president. <laughs> Wait, wasn't that last question the last question? <laughs> <laughs> and and question since you just brought up the concept of leadership, I was wondering if you could touch maybe on the fact that the Republicans in the Bush administration seem to be trying to control the national security debate and, and control the mantle of the security uh, issue for this election. Which of the candidates or um, what do the candidates have to do to engage on that topic and better articulate the fact, and as someone who served in two Democratic administrations that have provided some pretty amazing tools to win and wage war, um, what do these candidates have to do to articulate uh, a strong national security message? I, I must give you a caveat by saying I am a political babe in the woods. I've never been into politics, I've never worked and never been involved in campaigns before. Now having said that, <laughs> uh, my best assessment is that President Bush's campaign plan will be to run as a war president and to paint whoever he's running against 
as being unable to defend the country, protect the country's security as well as he is. Uh, if that is correct, that's just my hypothesis as to what his campaign strategy will be. If that is correct, then the Democrats, if they believe that's correct, should be running, pick, selecting a candidate who is least vulnerable to that sort of a uh, campaign. That would be a John Kerry or a Wes Clark or Joe Lieberman. Now, I will, just to, just to reflect my bias here, I'll tell you that I have announced my support for John Kerry. But I'm quite comfortable with many of the Democratic candidates and would support them. Uh, I just think he is, he is one of the two or three of the least vulnerable to that kind of a, a campaign. So if you're Republican, you do not want John Kerry or Wes Clark, I think, to be nominated. If you're a Democrat, you probably do. And that's the way I would uh, assess the, the gives and takes on the issue of, of foreign policy and national security in this upcoming year. It's going to be a big issue. The President Clinton was famous back uh, almost eight years ago for having invented it's the economy, stupid. This time it's going to be it's the security, stupid. People care. People are scared. People are, are concerned with the security. They will not, I think, elect a president that they are not convinced is going to be able to defend them. So that's my security analysis. Thank you. Bill, you um, haven't uh, necessarily made us feel good about the world, uh, but we ha <laughs> you have made us good, feel good about your uh, thoughtfulness. I'm afraid if this goes on any longer, there's going to be a draft Perry movement uh, at a 12th candidate to the Democratic. Uh, uh, feel you like that idea? Everybody likes that idea, Bill. It, it, it began here. It began here. Uh, but in all seriousness, uh, Secretary Perry, many, many thanks for sharing your time and wisdom uh, with us. Thank you all for coming. We're adjourned now. Thank you, Bill. I would